John Simone, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, so why don't you uh, give us a background, um, your, your personal background, um, and then a little bit about Brainbox. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been working in technology uh, pretty much all my career, uh, evolving with the technology. As you remember, in the 80s, uh, it was not uh, the way it is today. Um, so I kind of follow that path. Um, I would say that my, uh, my previous uh, adventure before Brainbox was uh, all about optimizing energy in building, but uh, I would say the old way, um, no offense here, um, but it's, uh, it was about you know energy, big a retrofit of uh, existing equipment, uh, let's put a new boiler more efficient, uh, let's, uh, let's try to put some economizer on existing equipment, uh, so always big construction project, uh, a lot of capex, uh, time to execute a project, you know, engineering plan and specification, manage the construction, commissioning. Um, you're easily talking 12, 18 months. Um, and then you, uh, you hope like uh, everything is tweaked the way it should and the saving will be, uh, will be at the meeting point, right? Um, and, uh, and usually they are. And uh, you are you're all happy, and you leave uh, you leave that project thinking job done. Um, and uh, that adventure was actually more on the ESCO side, so we we were paid a percentage of the saving over the years. Um, uh, usually, first year all good, you know. Um, and then the drift start this this infamous drift that you see happening, and you can't you can't really put your finger on exactly why it's happening, but it's happening. And it's a very slow drift. And uh, of course, the first year, it's not really an issue because uh, it's, uh, it's such in a small percentage that you barely notice it. But at the year two, when you have that uh, measure and verification annual meeting, um, suddenly on the year two, it's becoming like uh, more like annoying. Uh, you see that saving slowly disappearing like the snow in the spring. Um, and you, you start to wonder, you know, gee, this, this ESCO project is going on for another uh, four or five years. Um, so you, you anticipate as, you know, as an engineer, you start to anticipate what this meeting will be in two, three years. Um, <laughs> and of course, it's following that path. So by the time you're on year four, um, it's a very unpleasant meeting um, where it's always about debate and, uh, and where, why the savings are not uh, as good as they were the first year, et cetera. So it generates a lot of frustration. And when you, you dive into the nature of the problem, you say, oh, wow, I mean, this is, this is um, thousands of small action that on a day-to-day -day operator are taking and it's slowly defocusing the system and, and it's kind of making, trying to fix some problem, you make other problem uh, showing up and uh, we should do continuous commissioning. Um, oh, wow, well, let's do that. So we, uh, we actually, I went there, so let's do continuous commissioning. It's an after sales service type of thing. We're gonna charge that much per month. Uh, we're gonna build this control center with uh, top gun control people, mechanical engineer. They will remotely make sure the system is always uh, perfectly set up and uh, we're gonna offer that service. And then you hit that wall of, well, first of all, customer, building operator, building owner, not really inclined to pay for such a service. Uh, don't understand why should I pay for that? I mean, uh, why is it degrading? Um, so it's, it's a very hard sell. But then you have another systemic problem, which is there's just not enough control expert or control uh, engineer, mechanical engineer on the market available to offer that service on a massive scale. Um, it's just not, possible even if the customer were willing to pay for it you would not have you would not find the, the, all of the people to offer that service for for the entire building stack so so you're checkmate before you start and that's where the id start to to wonder um wait a sec i mean can we do can algorithm do that continuous commissioning instead of people and then you kind of fix the with one stone you fix that double barrel problem which is uh, algorithm would be costing a lot less than putting human 24 seven in a control center. Um, they don't take break, they don't go on vacation. Uh, 
and 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 the same time so the service will be very very low cost and the same time you could scale which was literally impossible with 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 humans um, so that that's how it, it it happened in terms of a uh, uh, let's let's that put me on that path to um, maybe we should use technology to to fix that problem cool yeah you just described like most of my my career there yeah I've yeah done, <laughs> i've done a lot of that old way style of energy efficiency yeah Fr frustrating it's right. always very frustrating yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely and yeah my most recent role was to develop a monitoring based commissioning um technology stack and then also the the services to wrap around it so I'm very familiar with everything that you just described. So cool. So how did um, how did you then take that experience into to starting Brainbox, and and when was that? It was in uh, 2016. Uh, looking at the autonomous car, um, kind of fascinated by it. Um, so you know they they kind of install this this. Uh, uh, equipment on the car, which is, you know, we look at all that equipment, it's actually costing more than the car itself. And, uh, and they do that to, to gather, to generate the data they need. Uh, but once it's done and they have all of that data about the surrounding of the car in real time, then they basically use that data to, to predict that future of um, where all of these moving objects around the car will be in, uh, in five seconds and 20 seconds and 30 seconds. Um, and knowing with a very high accuracy what this immediate future is, then what is on term of operational research, um, what is the optimal trajectory uh, or the safest trajectory into that future that I should follow. So then, then that become your, your control uh, strategy for the car itself. Like should you go left, right, or right uh, accelerate, slow down. Um, and they're, they're doing that with a, an incredible success. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very complex environment. They have milliseconds to, to calculate and, and call the shot, and they're doing it. Um, uh, actually, there was one stats that completely uh, flabbergasted me, was that they were, they were able to, to learn the behavior of, of squirrels and cats. Um, and, and, and if you think about it, and we all notice it, like the squirrel have this behavior as they they're not sure if they're gonna go, they don't go, they go, and then they suddenly they go. And then when they realize that there's something that is not going the way they want, they stop in the middle of the street yeah. and they question themselves again, which is the worst possible thing, right? And, and as a human, we learn over time that the squirrel will probably do that. He's not gonna continue his run. He's probably gonna stop trying to assess the situation and that's how I'm gonna hit it. So we, we anticipate that. So they managed to do the same on the AI side, anticipating the squirrel behavior. And, and I look at that and like, wow, if they could do this, um, we should be able to do the same in HVAC. We have a lot less moving part. There's less, less risk. And on top of it, I have the luxury of time. I don't have milliseconds to calculate and call a shot. I have minutes um, because, you know, changing the temperature in a room uh, takes uh, what 10 20 minutes uh, depending on the size of that room so I got this inertia on the thermodynamic side which is giving me the luxury of time to calculate so there's no reason it should not work um, so that was the the how the the, the the ticking of the idea saying oh we should do that use the ex existing AI techniques use an autonomous car and and use it for doing an autonomous HVAC that's how it's really started around 2016. Cool. Okay. Let's, I, I want to dive into the autonomy piece a little bit. Let's, let's back up though, before we get there. Um, why do we need autonomous buildings? Like what's, what are the other problems with controls specifically, you know, besides the fact that buildings aren't energy efficient and they don't, and they drift, like you talked about earlier, what are the issues with the actual old style of controls yeah so yeah so let, there's the entire autonomy uh, sorry there's the entire uh, continuous commissioning aspect which we already spoke about and yes at the beginning that was the target but then we realized that uh, if we're able to predict the future of what will be happening in that building with a super high accuracy or about 99 percent um, we basically know the future um, 
and the, and the, when we realize that the the deep learning algo were, were were giving us that accuracy for for hours and hours ahead, so we were able we knew that in three hours that room will be too hot. It will hit the cooling set point in three hours, in four hours, in six hours, and we realized we had that that luxury to basically know the future of that building with a very, very high accuracy, we went like, wow, I mean, we could do more than continuous commissioning. We could basically design our control strategy right now to have a better future. And it's, it's kind of going into this, this concept of when you think about it, all of our HVAC right now, they're reactive. And even if you use a PID loop, you're reactive. So there's something which is happening now and you're reacting to it, but you're already into that climb or that in that descent. You're already going through that event. You're not into the past or looking at the future. You're really into the present. And, and all of our HVAC system are reactive. I mean, they are program which if you hit this value, trigger this action until you have this other value, then you could release or you could stop whatever action you were doing. But the entire logic of our programmation is like that, is reactive. So it's, it's kind of similar than if you were driving a car and I was blocking your windshield with like a piece of wood or whatever, you, you're basically allowed to look on both sides. So you see what's happening right now. Um, you're allowed to look in the past, you have your rear mirror but you don't are you're not allowed to look in the in the front of the car toward what's coming at you so you'll be going through all kind of surprise um, and you're going to react to these surprise but you're already going through that surprise you you don't anticipate so if you were driving like that it it would it would definitely cost you more energy because you were not able to anticipate should I accelerate or slow down or just let it go um, and it would be very very uncomfortable in for whoever passenger is with you in that car and i would not mention the damage that you're probably going to create on your car yeah that um, sounds terrifying yeah yeah so it's so it's a, but that when you think about it all of our ajax system are acting like that because we don't know the future so we're we're following the schedule we're following action that are happening already and we're reacting to these action by a reaction and we're trying to stabilize as we go so knowing the future suddenly we could start to do preemptive action that would either improve the comfort um, or reduce the quantity of kilowatt that, that are spent to react to an event. And, and when you're at full throttle, let's say it's super hot in the summer or it's super cold in the winter um, and the system are at maximum capacity, knowing the future is not really helping you. You're already at maximum capacity. You will be running at maximum capacity for the next three hours. You're not going to save anything. But there's a lot of other period during the year where you're not running at maximum capacity of equipment and knowing what's going to happen, you could do preemptive action, which will save some, some money and at the same time will reduce the discomfort that, that these action and reaction are creating. Yeah, like 99% of the time, other times besides. PM. Yeah, cool. yeah, whatever is the, the building and how it was designed, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm writing a, a piece right now for for Nexus about um, how the old style of supervisory controls are really just quite dumb <laughs> when you think yeah. about it. Uh, you you have a system that requires a very expensive controller, right? And then you have a server that groups all of those very expensive controllers together. So you're talking about many like tens of thousands of dollars at this point. And now now you have this system that basically is a, a database that doesn't work that well, um, a trending device or visualization device for those trends that really doesn't really help you that much. Uh, you have some alarms that no one pays attention to. You um, have some schedules that are easily overridden and really aren't that sophisticated also. Um, and you have some graphics that are usually wrong, right? So it's just yep. like this, this system that is really 10, 20, I don't know, maybe you could say 30. It's like a mainframe system from before I was born, right? So, uh, yeah. So, Be so, careful, I played on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah. So compare that, like I, I've been saying, compare that to the iPhone 11 I just got a couple of weeks ago, and it's just night and day 
you have a very dumb system versus today's smart technology. Yeah. And I mean, and the beauty is, is interesting because uh, the people already paid a lot of CapEx to install these control system in the building, which are generating an incredible quantity of data. But that data is, is used on the instant of the moment, uh, maybe kept for a few weeks in logs, but then is overwritten, right? Um, and, and there's the very, very few buildings which are keeping like years of history for the, that granularity of all of the data point with the very small uh, reading interval. Um, but the data, I mean, you already paid to generate that data. So the, the big heavy lifting on the CapEx is done. You, you all, think of the autonomous car. I mean, uh, equip a car to be autonomous. The, the big heavy lifting is all of the electronics that you need to onboard on that car. And that's the barrier to have a lot more autonomous car. I mean, who has the money to buy these type of car? Um, the electronic onboard is more expensive than the car itself. So, but on the building side, it's already done. People already paid a huge amount of money to build these control systems, which are generating a fascinating amount of data, but we're not using fully the potential of that data to create a lot more value with it. Totally. All right. So I want to dive into the, the product now. So, um, I mean, I first thing, is there anything else? So to kind of paint besides prediction, um, Take us through kind of like a day in the life of an autonomous building. Um, yeah. Go. So we, um, the, there's really the two big component uh, once it's in operation. There's, there's the predictive. Um, so you're, you want to use these deep learning model neural network. Uh, think of LSTM as an example which gives you this very high accuracy in terms of prediction um, once you have enough data. So that, you know, one of the issues is you need to accumulate enough historic data to start running these, these systems. Um, so easily, you know, five, six, seven weeks of data within the same season. Um, so it's not something you could kick in within two days and say, voila, we, are, we have AI in this building. So you need to connect, you need to accumulate that data. Um, and only when you have a critical mass within the same season, um, then you could really kick in, uh, deploy these, these type of, of tools. Um, so there is, there is barrier uh, and you have to respect them. Um, so the, this prediction is, is giving you um, this vision of the immediate future. So on the air side, you really want to tackle the next three hours, uh, even though we have more the, the neural network will give you a high accuracy of uh, what's going to be happening on the air side for the next uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and even a few days. Uh, it, this is how powerful it is. But on the air side control, you, you don't really need more than three hours ahead of you. Um, on, the, on the water side, think of, you know, boiler, chiller, or water networks. Um, then you really want more six to eight hours. Uh, because the inertia of producing water at a certain temperature is something which is prepared in a longer time frame than, than the air side, make up air if you want. So, so that prediction is the, the first fundamental part. Um, so doing prediction, we, on the AI, we, we have a say which is saying, uh, doing the prediction is the easy part. Uh, doing the control is the hard part. Um, because the, the, the big issue we have like with building, when you think about it is, you're not trying to resolve one linear problem. So let's say one linear problem could be, I wanna maintain the temperature always within my dead band of the set point. Um, so that would be like a linear problem and you would not need neural network to do that. A classical machine learning tool would do it. Um, but then you wanna do, okay, I wanna do that. But at the same time, I would like to do it with the minimum quantity of kilowatt hour that I'm spending over time. Oh, then you have a second uh, problem that you're trying to resolve and you're trying to optimize both of these problems at the same time. Uh, but then, oh, wait a sec, this is not it because the utility, they're charging us on the power factor too. So even though I'm saving kilowatt hour, if I'm creating a super peak on the power side, 
I'm not going to win at the end of the month when I'm going to receive that bill. Actually, I could create a worse case because uh, the power factor of the bill, it could be very intensive in dollars. So, so we want also to optimize that kilowatt in power uh, as a third line that you want to optimize at the same time. So, oh, this is great. So now we're starting to have a more complex problem that you want to resolve. So you want to optimize these three lines in parallel. But wait a sec. We, we don't want to create some cycling on the equipment, right? Because we will be slowly destroying too fast, like a pump or a ventilator. So, so I want to make sure I'm not cycling anything here. I'm, I'm treating this equipment with respect and I'm not creating equipment problem down the road. So, oh, that's a fourth line that I need to optimize in parallel to the first three. And then your, the problem is becoming so complex. It would be resolvable. I mean, we would put like probably, you know, you, me and a couple of other engineer a couple of stats model uh, around the table. We're going to crunch this, uh, maybe with MATLAB, um, and we would come with the solution. It's probably going to take us a few hours, um, but we would come with that solution of what is the optimal control for the next hour. By the time we do it, of course, that hour is long gone. So whatever we came up as a solution is too late because um, we should have done that in, a, in half a second if we want to be efficient. Um, and just imagine the cost of all of us around that table. And we would have, of course, to work uh, 24 seven, uh, day and night, because you know we need to operate that building and that's only one building. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's all feasible by end, um, but the power of, a, of like a deep reinforced learning, and that's the same, the same thinking than, than the video game. So when, when AI is playing against us on a video game, he's quickly understanding what are the rewards. So how to win the game. So if I want to win the game, I, I need to maximize basically my points and to get points, there are several ways you could get points, right? So quickly the AI is understanding how to get these reward and how to score maximum value and win the game. Um, so it's the same, same technique we're using, but we're kind of presenting to the AI as a game saying, so you have all of these paths and you need to optimize all of them in parallel. And if you manage to do like a global balance, you're going to win the game. Um, and, and that's what we call the, the deep reinforcement learning. Um, and this is what we're applying. Uh, and, it's, and it's producing a better control strategy than the typical control sequence, which was already there in the building which is, as you described earlier, you know, based on fixed schedule, which are not always tweaked the right way, uh, which is based on reaction. So it's reacting. Remember, the, the AI knows what's coming. So he's got a clear advantage on that control sequence because he knows what's going to be the demand for, let's say, for the chiller in two, three hours. Um, so he could pre-produce water without creating a super peak. It was a good example um, that, that I, I like to, to bring forward in a, in a very high rise, a uh, very big high rise in Montreal. Um, one of the issues they had is like their chiller is working at full, uh, full throttle. Um, it's a beautiful day outside in the middle of July, uh, very hot um, and it's sunny. And, and then suddenly these, these cloud moving around 2 p.m., very thick cloud. Um, uh, type of uh, cell cloud um, and suddenly it become very dark. So within, within 15 minutes, there's hundreds of tons of, of chilled water that are over capacity in that building. Um, so they run up, okay, they start to run and they start to shut down the systems and, and lower the production because they're, they're in full excess capacity. Um, but the AI know these clouds are coming because right now we know you're taking the, these, these pilot data uh, sorry, this pilot uh, weather data, um, and you know exactly the movement of the cloud and the cells and the thickness of the cloud, and you know where they're going to be. And so you, we could anticipate that you're going to have like 200 tons of chilled water in excess by 2 p.m. this afternoon. And so you could start to glad it, glaze, glade in advance um, and slowly de deproduce, slower your production on the, on the cold water in anticipation of that and not reacting to an event which is happening suddenly. So that's just an example, but it gives you a very smooth curve um, knowing the future and it's saving kilowatt here and there uh, all day long.
totally. Yeah, that's a great example. So I want to circle back real quick. So comparing autonomous buildings to autonomous cars, it, it seems like um, it's a different output problem. So with a car, it's like, I mean, you're going to brake, I'm going to accelerate, I'm going to turn left, I'm going to turn right. Uh, there's there's limited output, right? Versus a building, it seems like they're, like you said, we're optimizing for more variables. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, I, I would say that you, you're right. It, there's more variable on the HVAC than an autonomous car, but we have less moving part. Hmm. So, so you're right. I mean, autonomous car has less variable that they have to treat, but they have so many moving objects around them that it's making, oh. it's making the, the problem very complex. On our side, we have very few moving objects. It's actually a very static environment, but we have a lot more variable to consider to figure out what is the thermal dynamic equation that will be happening here. Mm. And then again, I mean, the AI, the AI does not, the artificial intelligence does not know the thermodynamic handbook uh, that we all study in engineering um, because it's only data driven. So, but it's figuring out the, if this happened, this will happen. Um, it's figuring all of these action reaction that you see typically in the building and it's becoming super customized on, on one building. So once, once it's been learning on one building, it's what we call completely burn. Uh, that model cannot be taken and used into another building because each building is so different on the way it's behaving in terms of the thermodynamic side that, that really once it's learned that building, it, it's only good for that building. Uh, you cannot take it for another building. Okay. And you also mentioned this acronym LSTM. What's that stand for? Yeah, that's one of the, there's, there's a lot of different neural networks uh, that out there that, that could be used as one of the model. Um, we're, we're using several types. One of the things we do is, is we basically, we, we, when we do the learning part is we test different neural network model and we figure out which one is the best fit for this specific building. Got it. Okay. Cool. So tell us about the kind of the rest of the stack. So I'm assuming all those AI algorithms are in, in the cloud, right? So how does the, how do you get the product? Um, I'm assuming there's a box, right? So if it's called yeah. box, I'm assuming there's a box. So uh, tell us about the entire stack from, from the building up to the cloud. Yeah. So one of the, the big challenge we had to, to resolve, uh, and it was nothing to do with artificial intelligence, was the fact that there is uh, there is a lot of different controllers out there on the on the HVAC side. Uh, we actually did a count, and and we we we're, we went all the way up to about 700 HVAC control protocol in the world. Um, some of them are you know were created by company that don't exist anymore. They're not being supported anymore. Um, some of them were bought by by bigger company and. They're trying to support the line and at the same time convince a customer to, to switch over. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a lot of different versions. So, so on each of these control protocol, there is different version and building are not necessarily upgrade their control system. So they, they try to you know, go as long as they can without upgrading because they wanna avoid the expense. So it's a pure nightmare. You wanna interface with that kind of ecosystem. Um, and some of these protocols are completely closed. I mean, there's absolutely no way you could understand that language. Um, there's no documentation. The company does not exist anymore. Uh, good luck to try some find somebody that is uh, that knows about it. Um, so we had to create a, um, a edge device, a physical edge device that we could install in the building, and would be able to connect to that existing control system, and and talk the same language. Um, so of course, you know, BACnet was the easy one, but uh, think about loan work, uh, think about Modbus. Um, uh, Honeywell is an interesting protocol, uh, uh, just to name one. Um, right. So it's, it's, you need to be able to connect that box and that box is able to talk that language to first of all, discover what are the points. So an auto discovery, then read the point. Um, and when, when we read the point for the first time, uh, let me just tell you that it's a, it's a very rare ex exception when we hit the building, which is already a stack tag. Um, yeah. Most of the building 
It's, um, it's a very weird nomenclature, which is sometimes created by the technician that did that setup. Um, we see building, which is, let's say, uh, half in English, half in Spanish. Um, and uh, we see building where, where people are giving names to the equipment. I mean, so instead of calling a fan a fan, they give it the name of, of a person. You know, this is Andy and it's a fan. But they don't say it's a fan. They say it's Andy. Uh, so we have to figure out that Andy is a fan. Um, so, you know, nomenclature is, um, is a very creative world uh, in the building uh, HVAC control. Um, and so we need to, and that's a step that, uh, that we need to, to do manually. And actually, we, we were, we're working with the, uh, with the NREL in Colorado. Um, and, and we are creating what we call the Autobot. Uh, so the Autobot is a piece of, uh, of AI, which are which is doing that mapping, that conversion of whatever name they were using in that building to a standard A stack tag nomenclature. Because uh, it's only when you organize your data in that fashion that the artificial intelligence could understand what it is. Um, and that is uh, the te step that we call mapping. So still manual process in the, in the motion to be becoming AI too in terms of the mapping. So if the AI could do about 80% of that mapping uh, uh, and we still have human doing 20% of the mapping, I think that we'd be very, very happy if we reach that level of applying the AI for the mapping and the naming conversion. Um, so once that step is done, this edge device connected to the existing controller of the building will start to read the data and send it to the cloud. Um, so we, we have different way to do that uh, in terms of secure connection. Um, and that reading goes in the cloud where it accumulate in a database, which is specific for that building. And then we have to wait. We basically have to wait that, that period of time to accumulate enough data. We're also in the cloud mixing that data coming from the building with uh, detail, detail weather de data that I mentioned previously. Um, so you want that, that special weather data, which is giving you uh, the wind, the wind direction, the wind gust, the cloud thickness. Um, so we're not just talking about humidity and temperature here. We're really talking about detailed weather because there's a lot of correlation between, between what's happening inside the building with sometimes driver like the wind direction and or uh, cloud thickness because um, that's giving you directly the, the solar radiation intensity that cloud thickness. Um, so, so that weather data is, is accumulated in parallel on the same timeline than the data points we're taking for the building uh, during that period of time that I mentioned, you know, five, six, seven, eight weeks uh, in the same season. And it's only then that we have enough data that you could start to apply uh, this prediction. Uh, and for, for, for us, this prediction step is very important because it's giving us the the quality control that yes, we could start to do automatic control because the prediction is good. So, and it's also something you want to keep doing in terms of prediction analysis, because when you see a degradation of the prediction, it's your signal that you should also retrain your AI. So that's happening in different situation. It, it, it could be happening when there's a, a season change. So you were, you were, training yourself you were operating during the winter time and then we're getting in the spring you're going to start to see new behavior happening in terms of the weather of course and that will have a different impact uh, switching from eating to cooling is an interesting aspect and it's happening in the reverse order in the fall but that requires retraining of your of your neural network um, so they discover uh, new behavior and that's happening all along during the first year but it also could be could be user uh, user behavior change. So tenant, a tenant is leaving the 10th floor. Uh, he's going to another building. So suddenly the 10th floor is empty. And then, then they will do the construction on the 10th floor for the new tenant that's moving in. And then there's going to be a new tenant. Um, uh, right now we are seeing in the COVID-19 crisis, uh, all kind of behavior change on the tenant side. So there's a there's tower, which, you know, on 30 floors, uh, there's only two floors which are still occupied. And it's occupied by a government, uh, department which uh, used to work nine to five now and they're in crisis management so they're working from six in the morning to midnight um, so and all of the other floor are now empty um, so who's going there to change the entire control sequence to adapt to this new reality of that tower right 
um, feasible? Is it being done? Well, the AI automatically recognizes there's a big shift happening and that might will retrain itself to this new behavior that it's understanding. And after a few days, we'll be now completely understanding the new setup of the tower and we'll be trying to optimize that new setup. So that's retraining is happening in the cloud. Um, so most of the AI is happening in the cloud. And then we have a lot of what we call uh, control algorithm. So we have uh, about 20 something of these algorithm um, and they all focus on one part of the of the system, either either they focus on the entire tower, like we have an algorithm which is optimizing the, the schedule. So what time should we start the system this morning? What time can we stop the system in the evening if there's a schedule, if it's a, that type of building? Um, we have all the other algorithm which are uh, trying to optimize the, the temperature uh, of the water, of the hot water being supplied into the system at any given time. So same thing on the chiller side, we have other algorithm which are focusing on power peaks. So how can we manage to not create another peak of power that month uh, in the tower? Um, we have algorithm which are focusing only on air handling unit. So when is the optimal time that to start the cooling stage one or cooling stage two? We have other algorithm working only on fan speed if you have variable speed drive. So what, what is my, right now, my optimal uh, static pressure in that duct at any given time? Um, and, and we have to make all of these algorithms work together. So, so we need a coach, which is making sure that uh, the team is, is working, uh, doing a good teamwork and they're not working once against the other. Um, so, so that's the complexity of it. So, so most of these tactical algorithms are located at the edge device. Um, because they're the one that are doing, you know, these like decision on, on real time are located at the edge device, but they work in, in tandem with with the, the crunching happening on the cloud side. Yeah, so all the heavy lifting is happening in the cloud. So if you were yeah, to be, lose power, Yeah, because of the processing power that we need, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so if you were to, it's, it, I think what you just described is one, was one of the answers to one of my follow-up questions, which was, if you lose internet, that local edge device has basically the latest um, algorithms in it or control sequences in our in our industry's terminology. Um, yeah. It has the latest and greatest um, from the cloud and it's getting those every couple minutes as an update or how does that work? Yeah, we, we, we try to standardize. On the air side, we're, we're standardizing around five minutes. So mm -hmm. we're reading the point every five minutes. We're we're calculating that prediction every five minutes, and then we're deciding what is the optimal control strategy every five minutes. Uh, and then we're waiting another five minutes to, to reassess the situation. We, we decide to work at the zone level. So our fundamental calculation block is the zone level. And when we wanna know what is my strategy for the air and link unit, which let's say might be serving six zones, uh, we basically aggregate the uh, prediction and the control strategy for all six zones together and then you have your control strategy and your your prediction for that air and link unit and we, we keep backing it up if you want to know what's going to be your chiller strategy well mm. you back up from that valve which is opening the cooling um, for that air and link unit. you're backing it up to aggregate all of your air and link unit in the building to know basically what is your best strategy for your chiller at any given time so we figure that structuring it like this is giving us the ability that really we don't care the size of the building. So it could be a retail with two zones, or, you know, two rooftop, two zone, a small retail store. Uh, we're managing them, the two, and it's, it's, it's pretty simple. But a big high rise would be just like maybe 300, 400 zone aggregated together like Lego block. So it on our side it's it's just more zone and uh, it's not more complicated it, it's just take more time to onboard or to configure hmm. so that's how we kind of uh, build it uh, on the water side uh, the, that five minute cycle is too long so you want to have more like a minute cycle um, because you uh, you could uh, that latency of five minutes could become a problem on the water side so you really want to you want to more have like a minute cycle when you're playing on the liquid side. 
Okay, and, and what does happen if you lose connection with the cloud? Yeah, sorry, I mean, <laughs> forgot the ascent, the main no, the main question, right? Um, so yeah, so we we uh, as as like autonomous car, um, the safeties are more important than the action that you then your control strategy, because um, the last thing you want is to have uh, an artificial intelligence which is starting to take the wrong decision and uh, basically controlling your building, right? So, so you need to put a lot of safety in place to monitor uh, if the AI is doing, uh, first of all, is the AI working? Are we extracting the data? Are we getting the data? Um, do we have that communication with the cloud? Um, is the quality of the decision of the algorithm is the right quality? So you need to put basically other algorithm are checking if the quality that the decision being taken is the appropriate quality because you want to detect uh, through all of these safety if you have a problem and if you have a problem you want to de-engage the ai so one of the problem could be as you mentioned that we losing communication with the cloud so we need to detect that uh, and we need to start to monitor that and basically if the communication is not coming back within a few seconds, you want to start to de-engage. So de-engage means that you're starting to revert all of your action in a very slow fashion. So we want to have a slow, smooth landing. And you want to basically give back the control to the existing control sequence, which is still there in the background. It's still doing its job. And you want to basically put it back in control of the control sequence. So you're basically de-engaging all of our action and reverting back to that control sequence. And once the communication is reestablished, and even then you want to make sure that it's stable um, to avoid cycling on the communication problem, um, then you want to start to re-engage automatically. So these safety, you will find that in an autonomous car is, is actually more safety uh, about how you're going to drive that car than there is a control strategy of the car. So we have exactly the same situation where we have more safety, uh, especially on the edge device and on the cloud, then, then we have the scripts doing the, the control itself. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so it's basically when you have full communication, you're able to override all of the controllers and send set points and commands to them, basically. And then yeah. when you don't have communication, you're then just uh, removing that priority over the set points they already have basically okay yeah cool yeah um so yeah a lot of different ways i want to go with that that's a fascinating like view at your your stack and how all things work all the things work so thank you so one of the things that strikes me is when i try to um so shout out to maddie maddie is the one that uh edits the podcast and helps me with produce these and uh, one of the things that her and I talk about is like, what if I'm explaining this to someone who's uh, <laughs> new to the industry? Um, and a lot of times it's very difficult. That's why you're laughing. Oh, so, yeah. Well, so I think what you just described, while it's super high tech, it's um, for someone that's just out of school, right? It's, it, it's not that high tech, right? It, it seems like like a question that comes to mind for someone that's new is like, why weren't buildings doing this already? And one of the things that I like to talk about is it's all of the enabling technologies that enabled us to, or you guys to build this impressive stack of technologies. And so I, I think I don't want to gloss over the fact that all these are actually pretty new. Um, so for buildings at least, right? So you talked about the edge device, which I know you guys use Raspberry Pis. Uh, you talked about BACnet. I mean, that's not that new, but it's also, it is kind of new, right? It's mm -hmm. new in terms of the, the buildings are now being, like the control, uh, control contractors and, and OEMs are now being forced by owners to use BACnet or other open protocols, and that's relatively new, right? Um, yeah, you, 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 you guys use cell modems. And so that whole infrastructure you're building on top of that, um, all of these AI algorithms. So that's not something I'm familiar with. But when did those start coming on the map? Um, at in yeah. the advent of all the technologies in the cloud and that sort of thing? Yeah, and I'm, I'm before going on the AI, so I, I might just back up because it's a uh, um, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, just think of storage. 
data storage. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was so expensive that if I would have come to any CFO and say, you know what, we're going to read, you have a tower, there's about 40,000 point of uh, HVAC data. I'm going to be collecting a reading every five minutes of that. Um, and I'm going to accumulate it. And, um, and, and I'm going to use that, you know, uh, the cost of storage incremental because I keep everything, you know, you want to keep everything when you do AI. Um, we're probably going to have shut down the project right there because uh, the CFO would have said, are you crazy? It's way too expensive storage of data. But today, cost of storage of data is becoming so low that actually we, we're collecting all of the points of the building, even though there is probably a few thousand points that we're pretty convinced that we will never need. Um, we're keeping them anyway, because we probably gonna, we might discover in two, three years that finally we did find a usage for that data point and we're very happy to have collected the, uh, since the beginning. But, but I mean, it's give you, it tells a lot of uh, the price of storage right now. It's really not an issue. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the cellular connection. Yes, we're using a, a IoT SIM card from, from AT&T and, and, and Bell Canada. Um, uh, the cost per month is now becoming low enough that, you know what, uh, let's do it. Um, but not long ago, that cell connection monthly recurring cost uh, plus transmission costs, right, would have probably killed the project right there. Uh, not viable. Um, so, and then you get into the CPU, I mean, the, the GPU, the, the, the capacity to crunch uh, data. I mean, I'm telling my kids that, you know, their cell phone is more powerful than the most powerful computer we had at my university in the 80s. Um, and I show them a picture of that computer. It had a name and we were allowed probably 15 minutes on it per week, and you had to justify that it was a worthwhile calculation that you really need access to it. Um, so when you think about that, I mean, it was not have been possible before to do everything we're doing right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, neural network is a new thing. I mean, a lot of people are talking on the AI about, you know, neural network here in their firm. Um, but it's, it's a new thing. I mean, it's just really flourished in the last six, seven years, right? Uh, before that, it was not on the radar. I mean, it was being talked about since the 80s. Um, and you only think of the uh, Joshua Benjo, Lacan. I mean, they were pushing for that for the last 30 years, um, but nobody was listening to them. Um, actually, they were told that, you know, they were wrong many times. Um, and it's only in the last decade that they had their glory moment where everybody turned back to them and said, wow, you were right. This is the way to go. This is how we're gonna do deep learning, deep reinforcement learning. And it's been exploding in the last decade now. And there's so many possible application that, I mean, we're just starting to see uh, real application hitting the market which are bringing a lot of value and it creating new business model, uh, either for startup or for large existing company, but it's just starting to basically shape a new business model um, and, and bringing us uh, into a new world uh, in terms of what can we do uh, better. Um, so, so we're really in that stream of uh, applying neural network and trying to create new business model with it. Fascinating. Yeah. I love that story of like why now and it, yeah. just all of those enabling technologies coming together. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, so, okay. Let's talk about, um, challenges. So, and I've been in a lot of buildings. I've done a lot of projects like you talked about earlier, the kind of the old way. Um, and one of the things that when I think about if I were to go, you know, knock on someone's door and, and, and sell this technology, um, a couple of challenges come to mind. So um, what about buildings that sort of are in physically poor shape? So um, you guys have pulled a lot of data, but what if I can't trust that data? What if sensors need to be calibrated? What if valves are stuck? What if dampers are stuck? Um, how do you guys approach 
that uh, non-software side of things. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's the case in every building, right? I mean, right. It's, it's, the, it's the reality we're in. Um, so we're, we're limited by the state of the building on the control side. Um, so uh, if, if the data is uh, not uh, calibrated right, uh, you know, we, we see these things, you know, this room is now at 600 Fahrenheit. Um, so we, we, we have to discard all of these data points and we're, we're basically blind. So when we're blind in some area of the building, we basically do not engage any type of control in that section of the building. Hmm. And we, of course, we will notify the, the building operator, the building manager, the building owner um, uh, that, you know, I mean, are you aware that this is a list of points which are either not working anymore or are decalibrated? Uh, these are equipment which are not working anymore. You mentioned a damper, that's very frequent. Uh, you're sending a, the signal to the activator to open the damper, but the damper is not moving. Um, it's just completely jammed. Uh, so, I mean, we, leak, we, we provide this to the building operator owner um, may, and suggesting that maybe they should call their control uh, contractor and, and get them repaired, right? Um, but then it's up to the customer to decide if the, they wanna do it or not. Um, in the meantime, until it's fixed, and if it gets fixed, you know, that, that could take times. Um, we basically remove these area and we just control the area that we have a valid and, and good, a good data, a, a reading. Um, so it, it will create kind of the Swiss cheese uh, where we're controlling maybe uh, some of the floor, but not all of the floor, uh, some of the area, but not all the area. Um, and, and, and we do as much as we can with, with the input we get. Um, we cannot change, uh, we cannot fix that problem. It's really a, uh, it's a building owner, building operator um, decision at that point. Yeah, I think it's just like any other thing, any other thing in buildings is it requires not just the technology, but also the, the humans and the processes to maintain and maximize or optimize the, the service itself. So yeah. I, I don't think you guys are going out there and saying, you know, this is a panacea, right? It's, it's not, it's not going to fix no. everything on its own in its own silo. It's just like everything else that needs to be part of um, an ongoing strategy for the building. Owner. Yeah. We, we're actually, we, we actually try to say, you know, there's no magic here. It's pure mats. Um, so yeah. it's garbage in, garbage out. I mean, uh, we're not going to fix these type of problems. Totally. Cool. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that I feel like our audience here, people that are listening to this can get out of this is that um, it's not replacing the other types of building optimization that are out there, right? So if you think about fault detection, this plays hand in hand with fault detection in that um, I mean, maybe these are better control sequence, so there'll, there'll be less control sequence related faults, um, ideally, right? Mm. Um, but the physical faults will help, uh, like when the physical faults are fixed, the control sequences will be able to control more of the building and it'll be able to do better, better jobs. So, uh, cool. So another type of challenge that I, I thought of as I think about my um, average building operator, um, so, so there's, two challenges and they're both pride related. So um, <laughs> when I think about a building operator, I think about one that ha either has pride in his control sequences or one that has pride in the way that he operates the building without his control sequences, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in the former, it's like uh, we have um, the state of the art control sequences. Our mechanical engineer did a great job. Uh, I don't really understand them. I just know they're working really well. Um, and the latter, it's, um, I don't trust control sequences. I operate my building, right? Uh, and how do you guys approach those two separate um, pride challenges? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're touching uh, probably the most difficult part of, uh, of any project, right? Um, right? How do you make the AI work with humans? Um, so I don't know if you had the, the pleasure to, to sit in an autonomous car level four, but um, um, I was told that uh, I was really not a good uh, person to do that test because um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm fighting with the AI. Um, mm. I, want, I want to control the wheels. Um, 
I don't trust it. Um, so, and, and it's because I've, I've been conditioned with, you know, a lot of years of driving myself. And, um, and for me, you put me behind the wheel and I will drive, right? I'm not going to just uh, cross my arm and, and look at the show, right? So um, I think all of anybody which is, you know, been maintaining a building for, for years and years and it's becoming your building and, and you're very proud of what you do and you should be. Uh, uh, it's not an easy job uh, for, you know, think of all these tenants which you keep complaining and they're, you know, the issues and, and you're trying to maintain that level of, uh, of happiness uh, with all of the users of the building. Um, it's an art. Um, so um, with, with the tool that you were given, you, you, you push them and you configure them to a level which you're, you're quite satisfied and you did put so many hours to make it, tweak it so it's, it does the best it could with whatever you have. So, and then suddenly you have that piece of AI coming in and say, oh no, we're gonna go get like a lot more value out of this building and, and it could be very frustrating. Um, to see that, wait a sec, you know, do you know how many hours and, and years that I put into this? Um, so I, I, we like to present it in, into um, the, and, and there was an interesting story about it. Uh, I was talking to one of these, these person that we're, we're describing here, um, which uh, spent his entire career in one tower. Um, um, and he's about five years away from, from retirement. And, um, and he's, he's the ultimate expert of that building. Um, and he was looking at me and said, there's nothing the AI could do better than me. And I was like, okay, yeah, uh, interesting discussion. Hi, my name is Jean Simon. Um, uh, and I said, said well, I, are you going home at night? And he said, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're working seven to three, sometimes 3.30, okay, perfect. Um, so who's, if you're not here, what happened? Because there's a shopping mall at the bottom of that tower. So, mm. so at, uh, during the evening, you know, it's Thursday, Friday night, it opened until nine. You know, what happened in the shopping mall? And I said, oh, if there's a problem, they're going to call me. Okay. And do you like that to be called? Said, no, no, no. Uh, okay. And what happened Saturday? The shopping mall opened, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They will call me if there's a problem. Okay. And what happened if there's something happening during the night? And then, oh, I mean, that's not good. Uh, okay. So what about the AI is becoming your, uh, your second in command? And it's, um, it's uh, managing the ship 24-7 uh, so you could have a better night to sleep. So you, you could go on vacation two weeks somewhere in Europe. Um, you could go for lunch not being stressed that your pager is going to ring. Um, and he looked at me and said, okay, now I understand. And he looked at me and said, and maybe if I show the AI a lot of things in the next five years, maybe I could retire with peace of mind. And I said, yeah. Yeah, and the building and, owner would have peace of mind as well. Yeah, so um, AI is not here to replace people. AI is here to give us the ability to do more on, on our daily basis. It's increasing our capability or capacity to do a lot more and to maybe focus our creativity on the most important things and letting all of the basic stuff being done by the AI, freeing you up some time to do more important things um, with your expertise. Yeah, fascinating. I don't think I'd be a, a good passenger in, a, in an autonomous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an awful passenger as it is. So. Cool. Um, let's, let's, as we kind of wrap, get to wrapping up here, uh, I want to switch over to the business side. So this is obviously um, a technology that's on the market. So how are you guys taking it to market? Um, and what's your, what's your strategy there? Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're focusing on the, the first wave of building that we, uh, uh, that we uh, test the AI at first. So you're talking about uh, retail, uh, you're talking about office tower. Um, uh, so these, these type of building are, are, you know, more are focused right now, uh, but we're also stretching another type of building now. Think of a uh, of data center, uh, airport, uh, hotels um, are now uh, becoming uh, a new candidate for, for the application of this AI. Um, the, the, the model that we, 
we're we were trying to basically make it as easy as possible uh, for for as an offering. So uh, we want it to be a SaaS model. So it's a it's a monthly fee that you're paying. Uh, it's a service, uh, very 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 low install cost. Um, so there's basically uh, no downside to go and implement this AI. So you you get the box installed you start to get the training of the AI and then you pay a monthly fee, um, uh, which, is, which is based on the square feet and the energy intensity you have in your region. So it's a fixed amount of money per square feet you're paying, which is a, a much lower number than the savings than the AI is gonna bring to the table during the same months. So, so we want it to be like a, a very compelling offer where there's really no risk for the, for the building operator or building owner um, they will be saving per square feet a lot more than what they're paying on a monthly fee. And the same time is, you know, you don't like it. It's like your cable service at home. You don't like it. Well, terminate the service and send us back the box at the end of the month. Um, mm -hmm. So diff very different than my previous world where we were coming in with an ESCO contract, which is uh, we're going to go and we're going to basically go to a wedding uh, together where where you know this contract is for the next five eight years and it's a very complex contract and uh, once you sign you're in for the adventure and uh, there's no backing up right um, so I mean we we really don't want to offer something like that so we, we said let's make something very very easy to to accept and easy to to basically say yes um, and and value base really only value base you get the value you pay you don't get the value you don't pay um and the proof is in the pudding right hmm. yeah so it's it's i mean to kind of summarize it's cash flow positive no capital expenses essentially yeah cool okay how about um partnering with other vendors how are you, are you guys going direct to market or is it um par channel partners or how do you how, do you, how are well, you guys getting to building owners? Being, being, doing a mix of different approach. So yes, directly to the market, have our own sales force uh, knocking on door and, uh, and offering the, the service to, to customer. Uh, but a big, big also emphasis on, on channel. So I wanna, ha wanna have like the integrator, so the SI in a different region, being able to resell this service and also uh, having a, a, another layer, which is the, uh, the OEM. So having uh, control manufacturer embedding this yeah. uh, directly as a container or a driver into their uh, controller. So it's, uh, it's uh, AI brain box ready. Um, and uh, as that controller is installed, the service is ready to be offered if they want to subscribe to it but it's already embedded into the controller. I um, mean, in a similar type of, uh, of, of channel approach, um, we uh, were f finishing up our Tritium driver. So um, you have a Tritium Jace, you just download our driver from the marketplace on your, on your Jace, uh, AX, N4 compatible, and, uh, and uh, voila. I mean, you, you don't need to install a box in your building uh, you're ready to go. Uh, that Jace will, with our driver, will will do our, our our different proximity function and connect to the to our cloud automatically. Yeah, and and that's one of the things that I think is so exciting here is that you know, especially coming from my history, which is very similar to your history, is besides like the physical and pride obstacles, there isn't a whole lot of financial obstacle or. Um, really a technology obstacle to, to getting this hooked up. You think about all the Jaces and, um, you know, even, even with future in the future with all like people white labeling this or, um, installing it on mm. their own supervisory controllers. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We're focusing on the AI side, uh, for us, uh, our, our value to bring is the AI, uh, all of the rest is the plumbing that is needed to connect and make the data accessible. Um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're very open to any type of a combination that, that, that could be make, that could make sense on the, on the business side. Cool. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it's 
May 7th today. Uh, and I, I've been saying that on the last couple podcasts because um, we're obviously in the middle of a very tough time for our industry and for our economy as a whole. Um, how are you seeing that changing um, buildings and how is it changing uh, your guys' approach right now? It's interesting because we were talking about that uh, a few weeks back, um, trying to understand what will be the, this new world. Um, uh, I went, last year we were selling uh, more on, uh, we will improve the comfort. Uh, so, you know, we'll reduce issue you have on the comfort side. And, and a lot of customers were like, uh, it was their key priority. Yes, I want to save money, but I have this tenant on the sixth floor, which keep complaining and we can't stabilize the temperature. And if your AI could fix that, uh, it's worth the money. Um, uh, and there was also a lot of, uh, let's save the planet. Um, if we reduce the energy intensity, uh, I'm going to be able to say that my building consume less per square. Uh, I'm helping the planet. Uh, that was really the spin on the sale side. Um, we, uh, what we're seeing now is that kind of completely shift now. Now people are, okay, I need to save money. Uh, I lost two tenants. Uh, they're not paying their 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 bill anymore. Um, they're going down. Um, my revenue are coming down. So now I need to do whatever I can on the expense line to reduce that one because the bottom line is suffering like hell. So we're now becoming like a cost saving tool, and it's probably the only key driver that we need to push forward. As a, you have to perceive us as a as a no install or very low install cost. So, um, and I will, I will be able to have a significant impact on that expense line immediately. Well, within the first two months, right? You have to mm -hmm. learn about it. Uh, but quickly, it's gonna, it's gonna contribute to that bottom line number, um, uh, which is now the, the, the game, right? In this new yeah. world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about how like, uh, you know, it's May 7th. So, you know, at the in mid mid March, it was all about how can there's no one in the building, right? So can we shut shut it down completely? And now as we start to talk about reoccupying, um, there's people like me that are probably going to be working from home for three more months, I, I would think uh, there's not a whole lot of a reason for me to go back to the office. But there are quite a few people that are now starting to trickle back in, right? So a s solution like this can help uh, keep the energy, you know, it's not fully shut down, but it can keep things um, tailored to act how many people are actually there. Uh, yeah, I mean, time. absolutely. I mean, it's uh, uh, because of the retraining and the learning, the self-learning, it's adapting quickly to the new configuration. And, and you're right, it's going to be a moving target, right? Some mm -hmm. people will go back, not everybody. Take a typical tower in downtown core. You, you probably now, it's either completely shut or so it's basically on set back 24 seven um, or there may be one or two floor because essential services are, are working on these floor. Uh, and then slowly you're going to have uh, uh, this company on another floor starting, but starting with social distancing. So probably half the employee only going to come back, not the other half, or they're going to do rotation shift or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that control sequence will need to be modulated as a moving target from day to day as this uh, confinement modulation is happening. Um, and suddenly we could have a, a new surge and then the confinement is back uh, quite rapidly. So you need to rechange everything. So uh, we're pretty convinced that the AI will bring a lot of value there. We will constantly trying to reset and basically follow that, that behavior shift, which is happening on, on a weekly basis. Uh, uh, so, you know, once again, it will be feasible to do by sending a control technician to readjust a control sequence uh, on a weekly basis, but I'm not sure how many people will really do that. Right, yeah. And it, it, it seems like, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about on the HVAC side is, is modulation, right? So, and I think solutions like this allow a building operator to say, how can I also modulate my operating expenses um, in accordance with my revenue, which it seems like revenue is uncertain right now. So being able to tailor your expenses as much as possible is, is yeah. huge. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So I also saw you guys are, um, you guys just had a round of fundraising. So congratulations there. What's, uh, what's the roadmap look like for you guys um, over the next year, three years, five years, where are you guys headed? Well, we're, 
we're selling the solution or we're already uh, uh, doing several install in, uh, on the international side with, uh, with uh, a few building in Australia, in Ireland. Uh, we're now uh, going in Southeast Asia. It's, it's, it's quite interesting because um, with, even without like the tritium driver, I mean, it's just a box that we could ship by FedEx or UPS and uh, we're just helping them to install it with, with, uh, with the regular FaceTime on our phone. Uh, so it's that easy. So it's giving us the ability to, if we have a partner in Bangkok, to just uh, uh, ship them the box. They will uh, install in their own customer uh, in Thailand and, and we do everything remotely. So uh, for us, it's uh, quite easy. As long as FedEx and UPS are working, um, we're good. Yeah. Uh, we could ship. Uh, so um, it's giving us the ability in this confinement environment where we, we could still sell and we could, uh, we could still propagate that, that value generation and, and, and different customers throughout the world. Um, so we're definitely going to keep pushing that, um, keep pushing uh, the development of the, the things like the driver for Tritium that I mentioned. Um, and then go to uh, what I call the, the brain box 2.0, which is, uh, okay, uh, what about if we were building, um, imagine if all of these AI engine agent, which are operating in their own building, um, they're not aware there's other AI engine uh, working in a building across the street, right? Um, so imagine if we were connecting them together and they were, kind of becoming aware that there is other AI agent uh, deploy another building in the same downtown core. And what happened if they share information and they start to work as a team to the benefit of the grid? Um, totally. So, you know, the grid would be like sending signal and these, these AI agent knowing what's happening in the next hours in terms of prediction could be able to play a strategy to the benefit of the grid um, especially if there's a reward uh, allocated to them uh, by the, the, the utility. Um, so we call this the, the Swarm AI, and it's something that we will, uh, we will start working on uh, pretty soon. Cool. Yeah, it's similar to something I just saw from Google where they're shifting their data center loads across the globe based mm -hmm. on time of day, based on how clean the local grids are. Um, so you could think about strategies like that uh, which are super yep. exciting for yep. the future. Cool. Well, is there anything else uh, that you that you that we didn't cover that you wanted to sort of say to the folks? Um, no, I think I think we, we covered a lot, and I hope it was not too uh, too deep, too complicated to understand. Or, uh, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was too deep for, for our group. We got we got some smarty pants uh, that are listening here. So, uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll put uh, my take in the show notes. And uh, again, thank you for, for, for coming on the show. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.